Um, I have a question about um, the 100% model. Yep. It's interested, I know that we um, acted in Australia, so the council for something to the um, <laughs> talked about um, we try and talk about overheads as being necessary and why they're really important. Mm -hmm. Do you have any qualms about talking about 100% of the, the work? Yeah, it's an interesting one. Um, I think from the industry's perspective, you can fall into navel gazing pretty easy because there's a very small audience that cares a lot about it. Uh, it's very important for major donors. We talk to major donors only about operations most of the time. Uh, for the mass audience, for my friend's nine-year-old daughter, I don't need to explain overhead to her necessarily. Uh, I need to make sure that she can make a very clear impact and that she can understand her impact. We actually envision a day where we'll make giving to operations as cool as giving to water projects. Just like we didn't think we could fund a truck, we talked once about making an operations campaign. Um, I kind of love the day where we could peer-to-peer -peer fund my salary. Yeah. Uh, it's going to be it's going to be very interesting. I think we'll get there. Uh, for us, it's at a fundamental point. We're going mass. We're trying to talk to people who don't even care to give anymore, and we're trying to make them not only give but be advocates. So we believe the people that we're trying to inspire and connect with are probably the hardest people out there. They're probably the most distance from charity. They're the ones we want to bring in. Or we want people to bring in their friends who are like that and then give them such an amazing experience that they think, oh, I, didn't, I felt like I didn't know about charity and like I've heard all this stuff. There's always going to be poorly run charity. It's always going to be news when there is. That's fine. But now I gave to Paul. I know I made an impact. And I kind of want to do this fundraising thing as well. And we get a chance to take them through a journey. So it's a tough one, um, but where I fall is I'm talking to a mass market who doesn't really know much about this stuff. When I'm talking to my major donors who are very intelligent, who are most of who traditional charities really only talk to, uh, we have a very different conversation. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Nice. Great. Yeah, question from Ellen Clare. Do you want to ask a question directly around? <laughs> ah, you're there. Ah. Great. I, my question is in relation to uh, Charities held, other traditional tra charities held back because they're too humble. I think there seems to be uh, in the charity sector mm. a tendency for charities not to want to call out their success and promote mm. their success. Our, my audience loves it when we succeed. They love it. I'm always, I talk to a lot of our corporate partners and I'm like, the audience is, their audience is going to get more excited once we're like making an impact and we're celebrating what we've done yeah. than on the upfront if we say like, you know, they're not going to get excited by me saying, like, buy a pair of pants and 10% goes to clean water this month. They're going to be really excited when we say, you guys all bought pants and we drilled through wells in Ethiopia and here's the pictures and here's how we can connect with it. Yeah. So we, we plan for it a little bit. Uh, in, in our major campaigns, um, we, we plan to be successful. Uh, I'm running a campaign for India right now. Uh, charitywater.org slash September, if you want to check it out later. I didn't have time to play the video. Incredible eight-minute film. The best possible example of our model. It also looks beautiful on mobile. It's the first one we designed mobile first because that's where everyone's going. Uh, $2 million target. We've raised 600000 to date, but I know we're going to hit $2 million. We've got 2,000 campaigns already started. I'm a little nervous we might over-raise, but the metrics we're tracking are they're kind of under a little bit. But it, part of our whole plan is how we plan through success and celebration. But success and celebration is a positive thing, and I'm always going to land on the side of positivity. So that's probably how I think about that. I haven't had that question before. Okay. All right. Um, meditate to create. I'm guessing that's you. Elise, do you want to ask your question? Yeah, I'm just interested to know what a few of the biggest challenges are at the moment for Charity Water because it's such an incredibly, it's amplifying so much. Yeah. Uh, we, so we have huge goals. Uh, our, we're very focused on raising $100 million in 2015. Uh, our target for this year is $26 million. We're about halfway there for our target for this year. Americans all give in the back end of the year. I don't know if that's as pronounced in Australia, but Q4 just goes for us. Um, bless you. Um, it's challenging to hire software engineers. Uh, we're competing, we're hiring a lot of software engineers right now. We're competing with Google and Twitter and Facebook for the best software engineers in the world in New York City. Very, very difficult. And we've got to explain that to our ops donors. Luckily, a lot of them are, t are techies. Uh, that's probably not common with anyone else in the room, but it's one of our challenges. Um, we're challenged that if we are successful, deploying $100 million in the field for effective, great water projects is going to be really hard. Um, and we're challenged that 
building these sensors is something no one's ever done before. So we're right now going to oil companies because uh, they're the, they're like, for example, they're people who have sensors, um, but they don't have sensors that we can buy for 20 bucks and throw into a village in rural Ethiopia. Uh, so that's probably that's probably three of them. Um, yeah, I would say at the moment. Thanks, great. Um, a question from Beyond the Orphanage about charities and size. Should approach uh, approaches differ depending on your size? And it's begun on couch, just one person. Mm. And small beginnings kind of vary big goals like Charity Water does currently. Does, does your approach on social media change or should it differ depending on how big the small is? I think so. I, it has for Charity Water in my time there. So when I first fell in love with Charity Water, it was like my coworker Vic and her husband Scott, like making all the stuff themselves, like a part-time videographer and them kind of hacking stuff together, her working nights and weekends to build web, web pages by hand. Now we've got a whole big team, um, which is very rare, but I remember the days we were scrappy. When I started, our creative team was three people. We had one, like, 24-year-old techie managing the whole website. Uh, we're a different organisation now. Um, but the, I think the most important thing is the principles. The principles for us have always been the same, about helping people see their impact, about uh, trying to inspire people uh, through storytelling, through design, through creating things that are beautiful. Um, excellence is a really strong brand value for ours that might have even like crippled us a little bit early on, and it's very different to how we scale. Uh, so I would say focus on the principles of what's important to you, and then let that go. But we think a lot about how we can inspire advocacy and how we can connect with people, even now, $2 million raised online for India is like a really big number. It's just a, that's a, I don't know, that's a hard challenge, right? It's 2,000 fundraisers. Getting 2,000 passionate people, much easier challenge. And that's as we're scaling up. So it's amazing with the tools we have available these days, how much impact inspired people have and how much impact inspired people can change the world. Like, at least $100,000 raised in meditation. Like, I mean, you know, for you it's like, oh, yeah, it's easy. Like, we do it every year. It's amazing. <laughs> It's amazing. Who would have ever thought that could happen? Right? That's the, that's the model. And then how do we replicate that and, and push it along? I hope that's helpful. Great question, Chantelle Baxter. Um, so there's obviously a lapse time between when people do their fundraising campaign to when you can report on an yeah. app. There's like 12 to 18 yeah. So how do you keep people engaged during that period? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, did you guys come from school? <laughs> <laughs> no, it's, um, it's a campaign we're running at the moment. It's launched today. Oh, okay. We're all with <laughs> oh, okay, cool. <laughs> I would have worn one if I'd heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, no, it's a very good question. So uh, I guess this was a bit of a like, hey, look at all this cool stuff we're doing. And like, I should talk about like, there's tons of stuff that's really hard and there's tons of stuff we're still working out. So one is, I'm the fundraising digital guy. I wish I could report to people in like three months. Uh, but we can't do that. It's like it's really, it's impossibly difficult for our partners in rural Ethiopia and Central African Republic is currently in rebellion to move that quickly. And so that tension's really hard. We actually, dollars to projects, we might blow it up and completely change it. Uh, it's fundamental that we'll show people their impact. But for me, when, when we first launched dollars to projects, this was, because it took 18 months, so this was about a year and a half ago. When we put that thing out there and I was going to show my first batch of like it was about 20,000 donors the first time, like here's your impact, I thought this is going to set up, the, this will build the rocket ship. Like all these, how could you see your impact like this and not start a fundraising campaign? It fundamentally hasn't worked at anywhere near the levels that I'd want yet. Uh, I think it's because of the time. I think it's because people are, I'd say a lot, one of the things I've learned at Charity Water is that people are good but people are busy or people are lazy, depends. Most people are busy. <laughs> but like we have a lot going on. We miss emails, we don't realise it's there. So I think that one of the things that we're thinking about as a business is how to change that maybe completely. Uh, we, we will always show people their impact, it will always directly fund stuff, but maybe it's shorter and different. But the thing is, we'll just keep trying. And the other thing is, as a business, we're really happy to blow it up and try something else. So I think the time is a really big issue, because like who knows what they were doing 18 months ago, right? Like I can barely remember my last birthday and it was three weeks ago. Um, we had a good party. Um, <laughs> so yeah. But I think the thing is that we'll just keep iterating, keep, mes keep, keep measuring it, yeah. and eventually we'll find a way that see your impact is so good that for every one of those 13 donors, one of them starts a fundraising campaign. If we get that to two, we're a viral business and massive, massive scalable online growth is right in front of us. Yeah. So with that, do you think people 
buy in more to the fact that they can see their impact. Like, not necessarily, if you've got a thousand fundraisers, maybe 100 of them would actually go and seek that impact out 18 months later. Do you think people buy into the fact that they can more than that they actually will go and see their impact? I think we're still learning. Uh, one of the things we've learned is that there's a difference between our fundraisers who sponsor a water project and those who fundraise for it. Uh, which makes sense. If you're sponsoring a $10,000 water project, it's like you're buying a car or your fridge or a TV, they're researching it, they're very involved, they're engaged, it's very important, like it's, because it's, you know, I've kind of purchased it, it's my hard-earned funds that I've chosen to fund a water project with. Fundraisers often are motivated differently. Uh, for a long time we thought that funding a well was going to be very much what it was about and that we needed to put low cost solutions together and that people wanted to fundraise for a well uh, at average of 5,000, the average is kind of up to 10,000 but we fund stuff across the board. Spring protections in Rwanda that are $250,000 and biosand filters in Cambodia that are $5,000 for a village. What we learned is most of our fundraisers yeah, who average $1,000 raised don't necessarily care about fully funding a project but just that they're connected with the story, they're inspired, they're doing good, and they're going to get some experience and reporting back. Okay. But we're still, we're still like massively like trying to innovate and work out what they really want. I don't think we have a clear answer to that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So we have a question, I like this one, ben and, from Ben and the Sea. How did you pick your target market? It's obviously not 50-year-old soccer moms. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think 50-year-old soccer moms fundraise. Um, so we don't have a target market that we pick per se. Uh, the nature of the word of mouth movement is that they're building their own target market. Uh, we're inspiring people and through that network effect people are advocating for us and they're bringing in new people. I never would have targeted the meditation community, you know. Uh, oh, maybe if I really thought about it, but it would have taken a long way to get there. Um, our donors are certainly, our fundraisers are certainly youthful, they're about 31 on average. They uh, they're certainly at least web savvy enough to start a fundraising campaign, but anyone can do that these days. But we've had the full gamut um, of all sorts of individuals. We've had amazing Christian fundraisers. We had a church in Seattle that got a liquor license and threw a big boozy party and raised a million dollars. Uh, drinks to drinks, Seattle. We had two amazing Muslim girls um, who were about 19, just raised 20,000 together, and we used to do a day of Ramadan alongside them. Um, we've had said some guys ride a bike or something. It's all different things. But I think it's more the principles of they're inspired, they can see a way to make a correct impact and, and see that impact, and that's where they come from. On that, there's another question from um, Joanna. Yeah. Um, my question was, do you ever have your fundraisers go badly off-brand, and if so, how do you deal with that? Because I know thinking about the charities um, I work with, mm. that some of them would be really scared that, you know, if we're letting people do anything they want to fundraise and encouraging them to blog about it, yeah. they could do something which isn't with our brand or represents us poorly. Yeah. Like an Australian bloke without a six-pack running a marathon and a speedo. Damn by fate praise indeed. <laughs> Yeah. Is that a problem you've had, and so how have you dealt with that? Never. 27,000 fundraisers in, and there's, there's not one. We had a, Hugh Hefner was going to do a wedding once, and we didn't know how he felt about that, and then the wedding didn't go ahead, but they still had some donations. <laughs> um, so the, that's the interesting thing. That's a very understandable question. I hear that a lot. So it's one of the beautiful things the platform provides. From our brand, we have extremely high values of excellence. If I had an ugly slide in here and Vic, my creative director, saw it, this has happened before, she would kick my butt. Um, so hopefully this looks good if anyone Instagrams anything. Um, what we produce, we put a huge amount of, of excellence on. Our, our videos, our website, uh, it's beautiful because of the blood, sweat and tears that our brilliant creative team puts into it. Uh, my worst ever day at work was like, I sent an email wrong once and uh, copy pasted the subject line and it went out with upside down question marks instead of apostrophes. And my boss almost killed me and it like, was the worst thing that happened for three months. But that's from our voice. What people choose to do with it is that they'll take our message to their own communities in their own ways. Um, Philip Morris could start a campaign on our website, I hope this will never happen, and be like, smoke a pack a day and we'll donate. Um, <laughs> it's hard to see. I, I definitely wouldn't activate that. I definitely wouldn't support it. I definitely wouldn't push it to my community. But fundamentally, if they're bringing people clean drinking water, that's what the platform enables. It's just like on Twitter, like they cover with this, like we are a platform, like a Facebook or a Twitter. Twitter is probably extremely upset right now that Al Shabaab are tweeting about, you know, their terrorist activities in Kenya. But they're a platform. 
So that's a bit about how we think about it, but it's one of the virtues of the platform because when I first started, we struggled with it a lot more, but as a platform, we really give our brand out. I think I saw one question back there. Did you have a question? Oh, uh, yeah, it was to Plus? add on to Ben and the CEO. So I was just curious to know, you said that you don't target specific demographics, yet your material is quite targeted to a specific demographic. Like, I couldn't see that kind of material, like your video, for example, appealing to a 55-year-old woman. So is your team relatively young, or do you find that this is just, how does that work for you? Because I find that some advertisement can get quite boxed in by who you're It probably, you, I guess you would think it, it trends young and hip. I mean, I certainly think the brand is, is hip and the, the brand is useful, but I think the, the, one of the, the only way I ever refer to my customers in a demographic sense is I refer to them as seekers. I believe the people who find charity water are seeking to make an impact on the world, and when they see us, they're like, this is the best thing I've ever seen. That's how I felt when I first connected with it. I, I'd done all sorts of things, never a non-profit that I felt very connected with. I'd you know, encourage people at school to give blood, and that was great because it was kind of hand-to-hand -hand and connected. Um, for Amnesty International, amazing cause, was doing the like write letters thing, but it kind of, I didn't know what happened with it, and did I really make a difference if I wrote a letter to someone? I can never give enough money to have anyone ever care about me, so you know, I'm a drop in the bucket for nearly any charity. And then when I saw a way that I could have something I could connect with and I could find a way to change the world in a very concrete way, that was charity one, that was it. So, no, we surprisingly really don't talk about that much at all. We talk about, about inspiration. We probably, we probably build things that our team loves. Yeah, so is your team quite young? Um, yeah. yeah, our team's quite young, but the, the videos we've seen, like that one's been viewed 100,000 times on, on YouTube and it's all across the board. My mum's a little older than 55 and she loves all our, all our content. <laughs> <laughs> Twitter, but I might open it up um, for anyone that isn't on Twitter to ask a question. Oh, I am on Twitter. We're just, just, <laughs> 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 I'll be outcasted. Uh, first of all, brilliant, really inspiring. Um, just want to make a quick note first. What I really see as a difference is, is you guys are cool. And there is a problem with charities these days. You know, often you get a message that is more depressing than inspiring. Mm -hmm. So I was hoping if you could sort of, you sort of touched upon it throughout the presentation, but if you can sum up, you know, how charities or how sort of these sort of initiatives can really make their brand cool. Because mm. I think that is better than, you know, 90% of the things that are out there. That would be actually helpful. Yeah. Cool's a hard one, right? Because you can, you can be called cool, but you can't really call yourself cool, right? You know? <laughs> hey guys, I'm so cool. Um, <laughs> But I think that, to me, to me, it comes a bit back to, I started to rant a little bit about positivity, so I might go off and I have a little tangent about that, I might go on. Um, I guess on the, on the cool front, uh, the biggest thing is, is people and the fact we really care about it. We really care about building an epic brand. It's very important. From the day we started, our founder wanted to create something that inspires inspire his friends to give. And part of that is something that's, that's cool, because otherwise it's kind of like, oh, these lame websites. And pictures that make you feel sad. I don't, I don't want to connect with that. Like, how can I get there? Um, so I think having great people and giving them the freedom to do great work on the creative front is very important. Cool worries me, though. I think the word other than cool that, that I care about is about having a positive message out there. Um, so one of the things I found with the web, now I could be completely wrong on this, but it's the theory I have uh, on where a lot of the nonprofit spaces come with marketing as someone who's very new to the nonprofit sector and actually works for like a tech company called Charity Water that happens to be a nonprofit. Um, before the web started, you can only do one-to-one -one marketing, you can post people things, you can send direct mail, or you could take donors out to lunch or tell the story in person, right? I'm sure there's other stuff, but very, very simply, those two routes. The web came along. Early 90s, we get the web for the first time. The first version of the web was brochureware. Everyone took their print material, put it on the web, and it was a flat thing. The web, the internet wasn't an interactive element when it started. It was something we read, and we'd type in a website, and we'd read stuff, and that was all it did. And so it was great, because we just took our direct mail and put it on the website. And then the web's changed completely. The web's conversational, the web's about sharing, the web's about you and your friends across platforms. The web is your phone now, and the Instagram photos, and the stuff that's happening on Twitter, and it's this world of it's a sharing interconnected economy with two-way comms, and it's really about empowered people connecting is the web. Very rarely we go to flat websites and just read them now, unless our friend tells us to go there. Now, 
I think a lot of people miss the boat because the web changed completely to being about talking and connectivity and sharing and it's not about sitting and reading. Most non-profit websites though are still the same. I land on them, I can tell every page wants to get me to the donate page. I can tell it's totally measured that way, it's every bit of success, it's a failure if I don't go to donate, pull out my credit card and give. That starts a lot of problems because it's going to be easiest to get me to do that if you make me feel sad or guilty in many cases. Uh, I had an email the other day that asked me to imagine being a kid with HIV and donate. I'm like, that's the saddest email I've been sent for a long time. You just made me feel terrible for 15 minutes. Now, the interesting thing is the web now is more like real people connecting. Like this is, this is Facebook, right? Like, even though I'm talking a lot, but this is, this is the connectivity. Probably on Twitter you guys are like, oh, he's a wanker, so that's, that's fine. <laughs> um, so what the web experience should probably be more like that was the other form of fundraising pre-web, which was connect with people, inspire them, tell stories. You probably won't go into churches and tell them stories that made people sad and then walk around saying, can I have 20 bucks? Can I have 20 bucks? Can I have 20 bucks? You're probably about inspiring them and building a relationship and connecting with the brand. So that's part of, part of where I think some things are missing. And we think first about inspiration. If I want a $2 million campaign, I want to inspire 2,000 people and then they'll go and ask for money. And that's a very different attitude to, I want to get 10,000 credit cards out of pockets. Great. We're actually trending in Australia right now. Ah, rock and roll. <laughs> cool. Um, you have a that's fun. And then we'll go to you after that. Yeah, I'm, I'm oh. interested in um, what you were saying earlier about putting something under people's noses that isn't on their radar. Yeah. Um, we're working with statistics and more in the reforestation program. And our funding model is to get Australians to understand that the technology they use is having an impact on the environment. And so we've developed an app so that people can then track their data usage and then offset their technology which goes towards planting trees in Timor, hmm. and there's educational and a whole lot of other spin-offs from that. But getting that under people's noses to understand that, when you're saying that clean, that dirty water isn't on our radar, hmm. what I'm trying to do is get people to understand that they're having an impact every single day using the technology. You, you know, you stop at the traffic lights and you see everyone on their phone. Mm -hmm. it's, it's becoming such a habitual thing mm -hmm. that I'm, I'm trying to... Um, come up with a campaign to get people to understand that the technology they're using comes with the right to use it, but it also comes with the responsibility to make sure it does no harm. Mm -hmm. And we're really struggling to come up with the, the trigger to get people to understand that there is um, an impact and that there is an opportunity to do something about it. So when you say you can put dirty water under people's faces when it's not part of their everyday life, mm -hmm. What, what is the trigger that gets people actually stop thinking about it and then yeah. take the call to action and do something about it? Yeah. I, I, with us, we, we always start with content. So when I talk about the inspiration piece, it's about trying to create something that people will connect with. I, inspiration can't happen with like a picture. Yeah. Like sometimes we can get a banner out and we drop people somewhere, but like what's the experience they land on? Mm -hmm. uh, so content is very important to us and that's where we invest time and energy and effort. So for our India campaign, we sent six people to India for two weeks. I say, our entire creative team was gone. And then our video videographer worked on that thing for two months to create something beautiful. Yeah. But it's a beautiful eight minute film that's proved to be extremely impactful. 150,000 YouTube views, no budget, just pass around. Um, so, word of mouth at that point. Correct. Word of mouth is, I am the biggest believer of word of mouth ever. That's totally how we go to market. It's how we run things. We've, built, we've gotten very good at it. Um, you know, we have an audience, we ask them to share online, but you're pointing to, part of your problem is also part of the solution, I think, in that everyone's got these phones, right? I don't have the ability to push it. And so it's what can you give people that they can make their own and pass on? And then what's the, what's the action they can take in a way that, also you want them to make the action loudly, right? The action, the action is the thing that, you know, we start, we talk about the technology, we talk about that there's 168 billion mobile phones in the world. We talk about mm. stats to get people to understand the context. But as soon as we say it actually costs five dollars a year to offset your phone and it's costed two cans of coke, people shut down and we, we, we can't understand what that point is that people will make a decision at that point that they're not going to continue with the um, with their um, with their involvement. Hmm. So there's something missing and I can't It sounds like you're missing the step is. from what your mission is and where you get it to what can I watch and share and kind of engage on yeah. before I give five. So people are inspired and they're connected and they feel like they're a part of it. Five bucks is easy. That's right. But 
what's the middleman? Like for me, like we pushed the campaign out, 150,000 people have watched the film, only 2,000 have started fundraising campaigns. Yeah, sure. And that's always going to be the case. It's actually a better number than I've anticipated for a so long time. So is that percentage about right, though, that you're only ever going to engage a very small percentage of the community? It's pretty true, yeah. It's a pretty common rule on the web, 99.1. Like most people kind of passively push there and there'll be a smaller number will really activate and take things on. Okay. We've got time for one, possibly two more questions. Okay. So, hi there. And I'm from Cancer Council, Victoria. I run a campaign, it's called I Rule for Cancer. And looking at the fundraising video, it was very reminiscent of watching um, stories that I have from my fundraisers. One of them cycling from um, China to Melbourne at the moment. Somebody cool. does a head shave. A small girl sells lemonade. They're all really personal stories. And most people do it because they have a cancer connection. Mm. Um, so it's really inspiring. It's really passionate. It's everything that you're talking about. But they're not sharing it with anyone else. So um, my question is, I've got 62 likes on Facebook at the moment, mm. which is abysmal. How do I make those passionate and inspiring stories reach out to other people to just talk about it? I'm not wanting those dollars. I do want the dollars. Yeah. I want people <laughs> to just share their stories, talk about get that conversation, get that word of mouth moving. Yeah. Tips, top tips would be... Uh, the first thing that comes to mind, something we've learned that's really strong, is that social media can be a little overstated in these things. So social media is how I take a campaign to market. It's when I have a beautiful film and I want to get 100,000 views, I'll heavily lean on social media. That's what I want my volunteers to do is put it to their Facebook and Twitter. It's what I want to get a few celebs to tweet to massive following so they can get it passed around. It's what I want to place on some blogs to have wide readerships, so on and so forth. To spark passionate fundraisers. Now the fundraisers, uh, social media sucks for fundraising, essentially. When we have fundraisers start a fundraising campaign, if you want to be sort of, any of you guys want to give up birthday for charity water and raise it like over average of $1,000, send three emails. Do nothing else, send three emails to your personal network and ask them to donate, you'll get there. Email, email, email. And we tell people this all the time. It's top of our fundraiser toolkit, we try to convince them to do it. Part of it is there's plausible deniability in social media. Um, but more important is because people are giving in peer to peer funding at least, primarily for connection. They're given, I've had 250 friends give to my campaign. I hope a lot of them have watched the indie video. I've shared photos, I've connected them with Joe, I've shown them a photo of me with Joe who's in the video, who you can learn all about him, he's amazing. They're ultimately giving to me, uh, and it's because I bothered them a little bit, heavily at email. Uh, there's so that's about like raising money for those fundraisers. Correct. But what I want is, I'm sure I, everyone, every charity wants money, but I want more people to talk about my campaign. Necessarily care if they give money to the campaign or sign up, but I want it to be on their radar. Mm -hmm. And these people are doing fantastic things like cycling from China back to Melbourne. Why aren't more people knowing about it? I'd invest in creative. It sounds like that's a piece you're yeah, missing. Because that's what I thought. Because it's very, very rare for not profits to invest creative, but it's very rare. Like I talk to corporate America, and that's where I come out of. They all suck at content. Like, honestly, like our stuff is better than nearly everyone out there, but it's because we have a great, talented team who invest so much energy blood, sweat and tears in making a beautiful, beautiful product. Like two months, nights and weekends. I was getting in and our videographer was going home. It's because we care about it so much. Uh, very few brands put that level of care on, on creativity and it's, it's going to start winning. I saw uh, just one final point on that front. Um, right, that comes from me and it's like, well, that's charity world, that's their thing. I was at Google's Light Guys two weeks ago in Phoenix, Arizona, their big conference, saw Larry Page, CEO of Google speak, and he spoke about design and creating stuff that's beautiful again and again and again. And that's from Google. These are the king of numbers, like, who cares what colour it is, we'll just test it till we get the right colour. They've shifted on this position and they're pretty much the smartest people in the world. So.